This is called uh, this is called running down a dream. I moved to New York City in the summer of 1989 to pursue the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle that I'd heard so much about. Uh, I got a sublet with a friend of mine in the East Village, a college friend. She had the bedroom, and I had the pulled-out couch in the living room. My uh, Second day in my apartment, I was setting my stereo up, and I heard loud noises coming from the apartment next door. Didn't think much of it. I'm new in town. I'm minding my business. Third day in town, I'm connecting my TV to my VCR, and I hear what pit sounds like pit bulls playing to the death coming from the apartment next door. I don't think too much about it. The third day in town, I'm hanging up my Tom Petty Full Moon Fever poster while listening to Tom Petty Full Moon Fever, and I hear what sounds like a wrestling match happening coming from the apartment next door. That day, my roommate got home from work, and I said, do you know anything about these neighbors next door with all the noise? She said, oh, yeah, I asked the guy we're uh, subletting from, and he said they're a gay male couple, and they like to get drunk and fight. I said, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, do you know what these guys look like? I don't, but I've been told they're big and gay. I'm like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. So, my first week in New York was spent going out in different directions. I'd leave my apartment, and I'd walk one way, I'd walk another way. One night... I left my apartment and I walked to the West Village. And I got to the West Village, I checked out some bars and did some things, heard some music, and then I walked further west and I got to the, uh, I got to the water. And I'm at the water and there's a uh, good looking light skinned black guy in his early 30s approaches me and he's like, hey man, how you doing? I said, I'm pretty good. And he said, uh, you going out tonight? And I said, I'm out. <laughs> and then he said, yo man, I got some sweet dick. And I said, I'm okay, I'm okay, and I scurried back to my East Village apartment. <laughs> I was new in town. I'd heard of female prostitutes. I'd never heard of male prostitutes. I had, but I didn't think it was, it was a real thing. <laughs> so my first week in New York City was spent going out, drinking beer at the dive bars, smoking a lot of pot, and going to hear as much rock and roll, local bands, bands coming through town that I could. After seven days of this, I decided that I would have a quiet night in. So my roommate was gone, and I had the apartment to myself, and I'm watching TV, and I'm drinking water. And uh, it's 11 o'clock, the honeymooners are on. I'm watching the honeymooners. Uh, my window's open and the screen is missing. So I'm watching the honeymooners. In the middle of the honeymooners, a figure appears on my fire escape. It's a man about 35, very well built, uh, white beater t shirt on, short shorts, Timberland boots, handlebar mustache, and a shaved head. And he's got a tall can of Budweiser. And he's holding his head and he's intoxicated. And I'm like, oh, that must be one of my big gay neighbors. Okay. I continue watching The Honeymooners. As the credits roll, this man on the fire escape begins to take his shirt off. After he takes his shirt off, he takes his pants off, and he's not wearing any underwear. Now this man, in nothing but his Timberland boots and his white socks, is crouched down in my window that's open. There's nothing between us. And he's playing with himself, and he's beginning to get himself hard. <laughs> I'm new in town, you know, so I, I jump up off the fold-out bed, and I'm like, is, is there something I can help you with? And he's like, yeah, I want to get fucked. I grab my wallet, I grab my house keys, and I ran to the front door. I got to the front door, and I'm like, fuck this. I'm a New Yorker, I'm new in town, I'm not going to take any shit from anybody. So I went back to this guy who now has a full erection, and he's jerking off in my window. And I said, uh, I said please get out of my window. And he just looked at me and he grunted. And I said, please get out of my window. The guy inched back. I pulled the window down. I locked it. I pulled the blinds down. And then I ran out to First Avenue and went to the International Bar and popped a few quick uh, cheap mixed cocktails. I moved to New York to pursue the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. And in the first week, I almost had it all. <laughs> I grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, I grew up in a conservative, upper middle class Jewish home. My dad was uh, a lot older than I when I was born. He was 50 years old. He was a World War II vet. He liked Glenn Miller, Harry Belafonte, uh, Frank Sinatra, classical music and opera. He was very conservative, very Republican, and uh, he, he believed in, in a lot of the old traditional ways. He was very old traditional. He also had his own business. He was a traveling salesman. He sold men's and boys' accessories. Uh, my dad also had this temper, which I found amusing, and it was also frightening at the same time. At the age of 12, I got sent up from the dinner table because I was misbehaving, and I got sent to my bedroom. Now, in my bedroom, I had a little tape recorder with a microphone set up to record uh, songs off the AM radio. So my father, after I got sent up from the dinner table, continued, followed me up to my room, just kept yelling at me. And I turned the mic on, 
And for the first time, I tape recorded my dad, and I continued taping my parents secretly uh, <laughs> until I was 28 years old. <laughs> Most of the recordings were done on a boombox from the 80s, a lot like this one. Back in the 80s, the boomboxes all had built-in microphones, so it was very easy, easy to secretly record somebody. My father would come into my bedroom, I'd be listening to a cassette tape, I'd, um, and he'd say, turn that crap off, I want to have a talk with you. I'd say, okay, I'd hit stop. And then I'd hit the record button. No matter what tape was in there, I would just hit record and I would capture my dad. This is actually over Simon and Garfunkel's greatest hits, but I had it on vinyl, so it wasn't a big deal. So um, that, that's how I uh, tape my dad. So this particular tape I'm going to play for you, most of the tapes were done during my college years. This is from January 1985. I was a sophomore in college. I was home on winter break. This is the last day of my winter break. I've been home. I went away to college. I was home. And I went out every night for, for 30 days. I just went out with my friends. We drank, smoked pot, midnight movie, rock and roll. And my father didn't approve, to say the least. So this is my father and I, at the end of winter break, discussing uh, my last 30 days, among other things. Well, I don't know what it is, that's what you do. When you want the car, you're nice, very nice. I hardly ask for the car. Yeah, because you know you can't have it after 1.30 in the morning. That's right. Because if I did, you'd be out at 4 o'clock every morning with the goddamn car. <laughs> I'm just trying to lead a normal life. You and Mom, got it. It's not a normal life the way you're leading. What is a normal life? It means to be respectful and to, be, and to do things that are asked of you when you're asked, not have some uh, thing. Got to go out looking at records. Nobody's telling, nobody's telling you that you can't do your records. I hope you make your living as a disc jockey. I will. You start to get the rest of your life. I will. I'll show you. Well, I hope you Well, do. I'm glad you have an optimistic attitude for me. <laughs> I, I, I should do what you want to do. I'm I'm always you for the rest of my life. Thank because that's what you'll do with that kind of crap. You've got to bring these people in the same thing. Well, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. You think it's going to last forever, my friend? You're giving me an inferiority complex. Tell me I'm not going to do it. You're, you're, you're not going to make it. I hope you starve. Ha ha. Go into business for yourself. Well, I'm not interested in that. I'm I don't want you to go into business for yourself. Oh my God, you're sitting on all my yeah, posters. You can do anything you've got there, please. And starve for myself, right? You have to, yes. Well, I don't plan on starving. Well, I hope you don't. <laughs> hope you don't. I hope you make a living. I will. I've never told you what to do. I just told you where the thing where the best advantages are. Because I know them. They know will always be that way either. Never. You never tell me that. Nobody gets such a hard time from their parents as I do. Three quarters of the parents don't give a shit. <laughs> you want me to throw you, give, tell you a few of them they don't? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I could, but I'm not going to. If they don't, how do you know? What do you happen to? You want you to become a man and be a nice guy and have a nice wife and have a nice family. Well, I'm trying to. Well, I hope you do. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. But don't tell me that their parents don't, that they don't give orders like we do. We do. We don't. We don't ask anything that's not uh, sensible. I don't see what's wrong with going out every night during the vacation. Every, it's not that. It was every night all summer. There you go. That was my father. <laughs> Okay, in, uh, in honor of uh, Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to do my Jewish experience, uh, A to Z. A is for, ah, something us Jews say when we're decisive. Ah, I don't know, should I have the corned beef or the pastrami? I'm not sure. B is for bar mitzvah. My parents told me when I was 10 years old, I could have a bar mitzvah when I was 13, going from being a boy to being a man, and that there'd be a party and cash and savings, bonds, and all this great stuff. And I said, well, what's the catch? And they said, well, you got to go to school for three years, twice a week, and learn another language. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> C is for circumcision. My girlfriend, my wife, uh, from Oakland, California, grew up dating American guys. 
For seven years, she lived in South Africa and dated a South African man. Still to this day, she reminds me all the time, oh, the uncircumcised penis feels so good. The uncircumcised feels so good. It's, oh, uh, you don't know. No, oh, uh, the Americans don't know. D is for Drek, a Yiddish word my father used to use all the time. It means junk or crap. My father would hear me in my bedroom listening to kiss or cheap trick, and he'd say, turn that Drek down. E is for eating. Jews love to talk about eating, not just what they're going to eat, but when they're going to eat, when the last time they ate, what they ate yesterday, what they're going to eat tomorrow, what they're going to cook for dinner, how many calories something has, what the neighbor who came over for dinner ate at the table. Uh, F is for fucking Jew. If you want to offend a Jew, Kike is very passe. If you want to offend a Jew, you say, fucking Jew. G is for Gentile. My parents used to tell me, you should date a Jewish girl, you should date a Jewish girl. And I said, well, I like Gentiles. I like Gentiles. And they said, well, how, why do you like Gentiles so much? I said, because they don't have as much hair as Jewish girls. <laughs> to which my parents had no response whatsoever. H is for Hanukkah, the festival of lights, which falls uh, every December. Now, there's eight nights of Hanukkah. Jewish kids are supposed to get a gift for eight nights of Hanukkah. My parents gave me a gift on the first night and the last night of Hanukkah. I don't know why, probably because they were Jewish. <laughs> I is the way every Jew begins a sentence. I'm uncomfortable. I'm hot. I'm tired. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. J is for Jesus Christ, a great Jew. Growing up, my father, I thought Jesus Christ was a swear word because my father would say, Jesus Christ, God damn it, Jesus Christ. K is for kosher. I had a friend whose parents kept kosher when I was a teenager, and they had the silverware drawer for the meat and the silverware drawer for the dairy. I thought this was, was kind of silly, so I, I mixed a couple of utensils up when nobody was looking because it's all going into the same dishwasher. Right? What do you what do you think? I'm kosher? It doesn't make any sense. The same stomach, mouth? Come on. <laughs> Ellis for Lenny Bruce, another great Jew. M is for Meshuggah, another Yiddish word my father uh, used to use a lot. Back in the early 80s, I listened to the New Wave and the punk rock, and I wore some of the attire that us New Wave punk rockers would wear, and one of them was black eyeliner. And my father, being the World War II vet that he was, would see me leaving the house with black eyeliner on, <laughs> and he'd say, where are you going with those black eyes? Real Meshuggah. M is for Never Again, something us Jews love to say in reference to another Holocaust. Never Again! O is for Oneg Shabbat. Oneg Shabbat is a smorgasbord of desserts following Friday night temple services. My parents would say, Michael, would you like to go to temple with us tonight? And I'd say, no thanks, it's boring. And they'd say, but there's going to be an Oneg Shabbat after services. And I would be in the car with my seatbelt on, and I would gorge myself following temple services on pastries and donuts and cookies and everything. It was the only way they could get me to go to temple. There wasn't always an Oneg Shabbat. P is for pain in the ass. Jews are a pain in the ass. I worked at a Jewish country club. I was the only Jew employee working amongst the Gentiles serving the Jews in a Jewish country club. And all I heard was like, this is too hot. This is too cold. How come the Schumans got their food before we did? What's taking so long? <laughs> Q is for queasy. Uh, my sister uh, used this product called Jolene to turn her, her black facial hair into invisibleness. <laughs> I used to watch my sister with the Jolene and it would make me queasy. R is for Rabbi Marty Goldberg, the rabbi from my birth to my mother's death. Uh, he was there the whole, the whole uh, life of my family. And it was my mother's funeral, and Rabbi Goldberg approached me, and he said, uh, Michael, I'm writing a sermon uh, for your mom. Is there anything that you would like to add? And I thought about all the cool rock shows I had taken my mom to see, including Jerry Lee Lewis, Tom Jones, Gillian Welch, Grateful Dead, the Rolling Stones. And how cool it was, my mother, who was so much older than I, went to these rock shows with me. And I said, if you could mention that, that would be great. So in the middle of the service, uh, the rabbi said Grateful Dead and Rolling Stones, and I was so excited to hear two of my favorite bands during my mother's funeral. My sister gave me a dirty look. Mm -hmm. S is for shitting. Jews love to talk about shitting. When they shit yesterday, when they're going to shit tomorrow, what their shit is like, did it sink, did it float? I got to take a shit, I'm so, I'm so backed up. T is for Torah. This holy scripture to some people, uh, it's not that holy to me. Uh, Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks is a lot more uh, spiritual and holy to me than the Torah is. U is for up. Uh, Jews don't believe in hell. We believe when we die, there's only one way to go, and that's up. V is for volunteer work. Jews love to do volunteer work when it's for other Jews. <laughs> w is for what's the black man in the suit doing in temple, Dad? <laughs> 
the only black men I saw in my temple were men that were working there, janitors, electricians, plumbers, and I saw a black man in a suit, and I asked my father, well, what's going on? And he said, oh, he converted, he married Wendy Goldstein, and he's a member of our congregation. And I said, what does it mean to convert? Oh, to, to go from one religion and become a Jew, and that's the best kind. <laughs> X is for Xerox. Us Jews need to have a copy of anything in case we need to sue. <laughs> Why is for Yiddish, an ancient dying language? My father used a lot of Yiddish. One of their favorite words was shpilkas. They used to tell me I had shpilkas, which is ants in the pants. Z is for Zionists. These people are Zionists, Israel, Israel, Palestine, Jews, and Israel, Israel, Israel. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not that excited about Israel. I have more in common with uh, a pint of Guinness and the sound of bagpipes. <laughs>